We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a do-it-yourself blog, YouTube channel, and podcast that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 129 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. This episode is going to be a lot of fun because I'm going to share with you 20 things that I learned in carpentry school. That's right. So some of you have been following me for a while and you know that I actually attended carpentry school at my local community college. And this is, it was a crazy idea. (laughs) I mean, even looking back, thinking about the fact that there I was, a 40-year-old mom of three sitting in class with all these 18, 19, 20-year-old boys And there was maybe a couple girls in some of the classes, but for the most part, it was just a lot of young guys. And I just decided that I wanted to learn carpentry. And when I first signed up for this, it was a certificate program. And all you had to do was uh, complete six courses. And I thought, okay, here's the six courses I have to complete. Introduction to building trades and framing and a couple other things. And I thought, this sounds like fun. I'm going to do it. And I remember sitting there in that first class thinking, what did I get myself into? (laughs) I am so out of place. And I almost left. And I'm glad that I didn't. Now, as time went on, I really started, I mean, I enjoyed it from the very beginning. And I started becoming a little bit more comfortable being in the class and, you know, feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm old enough to be these kids' mom. But I learned a lot. And I actually got along with a lot of the people in the classes that I took. And then surprisingly, as I went on, there were other people who were even older than I was, and there was more females. And it was just such a great experience. And I had decided instead of doing the six class certificate, I was going to get my AA. And, you know, when you take classes at a community college, you've got to do your main coursework. You've got to do all your prerequisites, but I already have a four-year, well, I've actually got my master's, but I already have a four-year degree from the University of Maryland in psychology. So because I had done all of that English 101 and Spanish and all of those electives, I could transfer a lot of that over to the community college. The only thing is, (laughs) you're going to, you're going to be like, Serena, why haven't you actually done anything about this? Do you know that they were telling me that I still had one I think there was maybe like one or two classes that they were telling me that I still needed. And it had nothing to do with carpentry. Like I finished all of those courses. I finished all of those electives. I did the electrical wiring. I did architecture. And they said, oh, you still need this other architecture. I mean, you still need this carpentry class. Well, I actually completed that class, but somehow it didn't end up on my transcript. But do you know that it's been a couple years and I never followed up on it. So I never actually got the AA degree. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? And every now and then I keep looking at, you know, I'll, I'll look at my list of things that I have to do, right? We all have this general list of things that we have to do. And it's one of the things on my list, I need to follow up with this school and talk to the carpentry instructor and say, Hey, can you talk to the people in the, uh, you know, the records office so that I can get my degree. I don't care about walking across the stage. I paid for (laughs) all of those credits. And I want to get my degree. I want to hang it on the the she shed walls here. But anyway, that's kind of like a little bit of a, a little bit of an aside. But and to give you a little bit of background about how I even went to carpentry school. But this was a really great experience. And I loved um, Mr. McNally. He was the carpentry instructor that that taught pretty much all of the carpentry classes. And while I was doing some of the the lower level introductory classes, there were some really interesting things that I learned in this class. And I had written a blog post about it. Some of you may have seen it. But if you haven't, we're going to talk about those 20 surprising things that I learned in carpentry class in carpentry school. I just, you know, thinking about it, ah, oh, it was just such a great experience. I love learning. And I love home improvement. I love building. And even just talking about this, it makes me wish that maybe I even go back to school for another, you know, another couple of years and just learn something else. I mean, they had automotive, they had electrical wiring. And I just 
love the idea of going back to school. Now, will I actually do that? Maybe not, but you never know. <laughs> you never know what happens here at Thrift Diving. Okay, so let's jump into these 20 surprising things. The first thing that I learned that was really surprising is that there is a reason why your house doesn't burn quickly when there's a fire. And, you know, we, we all know how f- quick moving fire is, right? But did you know that over years of building, carpenters have really learned how to build fire resistance into homes? And it's not just with the materials that they use, but with the method that they build the homes. And it all comes down to something called fire blocking. Now, if you were to peek behind your drywall, or if you have ever seen a home under construction or any kind of construction, but if you've seen, you know, you've taken out a wall, you might have noticed something very interesting. So you've got your horizontal pieces of wood, right? Those are your vertical studs. And you, if you look closely, you'll actually see little pieces, I say little, but they're shorter blocks of two by fours that are going horizontal across your wall. Well, the reason why you have this, it's called fire blocking is so that if there is a fire behind your wall, these pieces of fire blocking actually prevent that fire from going straight up those studs. And, you know, years ago, there was a really popular um, framing called balloon framing. This is where there were long studs that ran the entire length of your home from like the floor to the roof. And when the fires broke out in the walls, the fire would just quickly travel up the entire length of the stud and it would cause the roof to collapse. So that's the last thing that you want to happen during a fire. So later what they did was they actually implemented fire blocks in between, which are those shorter studs that are running horizontal because it gives the fire a chance to pause and then burn through that horizontal fire blocking so that you've got time to escape. So if you've ever looked at the framing or, you know, maybe you're building a home right now or, you know, you won't find it in a shed per se. I mean, maybe you will. I, I didn't, I don't have it in my shed. Um, but in, but in homes that are being built, you will find that fire blocking. And I just thought it was very interesting and amazing that over time, you know, the, the people have just figured out how to to build homes to be more fire resistant. Oh, another thing I'll tell you too, and this is just totally an aside. This weekend, I had the the pleasure, it was so much fun of participating in something with Habitat for Humanity. And it was like, it was a fall festival. And they had some uh, vendors like local vendors come out and um, set up a booth. And so I had a desk there that I was showing people, hey, you can paint furniture really easily. Well, there was a, there was four firemen that came over and the one guy, you could tell he was kind of interested. And I said, have you ever painted furniture before? He said, no, I've never painted furniture. I said, here, take this roller and give it a couple coats. (laughs) So, you know, I, I should have posted it on my Instagram. I didn't, but it was so cute because he had never painted furniture before. He thought it was difficult, but here he was doing this. So anyway, he and his friends, once he was done his couple coats, his friends come over, his colleagues, and I'm asking him, I said, you know, what's, what's something that most homeowners don't know about fires? And he said, the one thing that, well, not one, there's more than one thing, but the thing that he pointed out is that you should always close your door. So if there's a fire that breaks out in your home, he said, there's a huge difference between what a room with fire damage looks like if the door's open versus if the door's closed. And so he didn't specifically say close your door while you're sleeping at night, but he did say that if, if there is a fire, I mean, I think most of us probably, I don't want to say common sense, but you're most, you're most likely to close the door, right? To keep that smoke out. But I'm going to go ahead and say, and I've seen this, I've seen this before online, things, you know, going viral, showing what happens to a home if you leave a door open versus if it's, if it's closed. So just a little aside, since we're talking about fires and fire blocking, make sure that you sleep with your door closed. I think most people probably do, but not everybody does. If you close your door and a fire does break out, you're less likely to have damage and smoke inhalation and all of that versus if you have the door open. So just thought that was really interesting. That was passed on from the, the volunteer fire department <laughs> at my local Habitat for Humanity event. Okay, moving on to 
the second thing that I learned that was actually pretty interesting. And I think I kind of knew this myself, and most of us do, but some of us may not. Okay, the thing that's, that's very surprising is that you have to call 811 before you dig on your property. And this is even if you're planting trees, only if you're planting trees, and not only, but even if you're only planting trees, you have to call 811. So what's 811? Well, imagine taking your shovel, you're slinging it over your shoulder, you're whistling while you work, you're just going to plant this new apple tree on your property. No big deal, right? You can just start shoveling and plant it. Well, that's actually not the case. You have to call 811, which is the number that nationally you would call that number and they would come and mark where your your buried utility lines are on your property. Because guess what happens? <laughs> if you hit something and you actually, let's say you hit a gas line, you didn't know, you can actually be held responsible for thousands of dollars because you didn't call 811. And you know, in my mind, when I was when I was taking this carpentry class, in my mind, I thought, well, I know how to I know how to call eight one one. I've done projects around my home, but I didn't know that even if you are just even replacing your mailbox, or putting in a new mailbox, or planting trees, or building a fence, or anything that is going to require you to dig on your property, you have to call eight one one. And you know, you can also go online. It's call eight one one dot com. They will trans you, transfer you to Miss Utility for your state, and then you submit that request. And if your state's like my state of Maryland, they will usually within two days send a utility worker over to your house. They'll mark your property, and then you'll you'll know where your utility lines are, and you can start doing your project. And um, here's a tip: because you are you know a homeowner, and you may have other projects that you're doing you might want to take a picture of where they actually mark. Now, it doesn't mean that you can skip calling 811. You know, you don't necessarily want to do that. But let's say that you start a project, you have a little bit of an interruption, and, or I don't know, maybe there's a storm, and wherever they marked, those flags come out. I don't know if they're using, they use flags here in Maryland. Um, But there could be some reason why that flag, or maybe your kids are outside playing around and you didn't even start on your project yet. And your kids are playing around and they, they take the flags out and now they're playing with them. And now you don't know exactly where those utilities are marked. So here's the tip. Take a picture whenever they come to mark where your utilities are, take a picture. And then that way, uh, when you start your project, even if it's a week later, you can be sure that you have some accountability of where this is. And maybe you just follow behind with a, you know, just a little shot of spray paint, something to mark that you don't want to, you know, get those marked, wait, and then, you know, or you accidentally mow over <laughs> with your lawnmower where it's marked. You just want to make sure that you're, you're capturing where this is. And um, if for any reason, if you are not sure of like, let's say you have a general area, then by all means, just dig by hand. Don't use heavy equipment. Um, because there are some, there are some times where maybe you're not quite sure they marked it and you're kind of sure you might just want to dig by hand. And then I think with certain, like once you get within, uh, I think it's two feet, you have to, of a marked utility line, you have to dig by hand. You can't use heavy equipment. So that was something surprising. I, I didn't know. I thought, okay, well, if I'm doing some big construction on my property, I have to call 811. But no, even if you're planting trees, putting in a new mailbox, you know, any of those things, you still have to call 811. All right, this was something that was really interesting. So concrete has to be mixed with clean, drinkable water. <laughs> now, when I think of concrete, I think of like those big dusty bags at the hardware store, you just simply pour it into a hole Add a little bit of tap water and vo- voila, you've got instant concrete. But like in the real world of construction, when it comes to building like basement walls or building other concrete structures, it's actually not that simple. So what I learned in carpentry class is that concrete actually has a combination of sand, gravel, Portland cement, and drinkable water. And I thought this was intriguing. Um, so I had looked up on cement.org and it said that excessive impurities in mixing water not only may affect the settling time 
and the strength of the concrete, but it can also cause, um, I don't know what this is, efflorescence, I can't even pronounce it, efflorescence. I don't know what that is, but I think that's when, when maybe you get like that chalky substance that, that you get when concrete's drying, but it can also cause staining, um, corrosion of the reinforcements. It can cause like just reduced durability. So <laughs> just imagine if you were building a bridge and you used, and they used dirty water, like that's, that's not what you want to do. So just, you know, I would say if you're doing some concrete projects around your home, definitely make sure that you're mixing this with drinkable water. And so, you know, I, I, I don't know if you can use tap water. To me, it sounds like it could, you could have some impurities in your tap water that could affect that concrete. So just make sure, you know, you're using drinkable water. You may have to do a little bit more research. I don't have a ton of, I didn't research these completely, but I will tell you it's true, but make sure that you do your research before you're, you're building anything with concrete on your property. All right. So number four, you should only put one bare unprotected hand into a breaker box. (laughs) Okay. Now I will say that before doing my electrical wiring class, electricity scared the crap out of me. I mean, it still scares me, right? Like one slip up and your life can end. And I, you know, I've always thought that electricians protecting themselves from electrical shock, you know, that they would use like gauntlet gloves and chain mail and rubber coated tools. Like I knew that they used protection, but what I found interesting is that in class, I learned that you can actually put, and don't try this, please do not try this, but this is just what I heard in carpentry class. But I found it interesting that you could put safely one bare unprotected hand into a breaker box at a time. You could not use two. If you actually use two hands, you have to use those rubber gauntlet gloves. But electricians, they know this, but homeowners may not. So you know, whenever in doubt, always hire an electrician for anything that's questionable electrical work. I mean, hands down. Yes, I did do the electrical wiring in my shed, but I did have the, uh, my electrical instruction or instructor overseeing everything that I did. So, and I didn't do the box, the electrical box. He did all of the hookups from the house to the shed and then here in the shed, anything pertaining to the box, he did. So yes, hire a professional <laughs> to do those things. Um, but I did find that interesting because I I never I never thought that you could even put a bare hand at all into a um, into a, a breaker box. But apparently, you can put one hand. You just can't use two unless you have the rubber gauntlet gloves. Very interesting. All right, number five. It's illegal for homeowners to do their own HVAC projects. (laughs) Now, if you're like me, you probably don't know anything about HVAC, right? I mean, I know a little bit about electrical wiring. I've learned things as I go, but it's actually illegal for homeowners to do their own HVAC repairs and maintenance. So even if I did know something about that, by law, and I think this is national, I don't know if it's state, but it could be, it probably is. But most states probably have some sort of rule or law that says you cannot, as a homeowner, do your own HVAC. Let me tell you, HVAC, people that study HVAC, they've got to know plumbing, they've got to know electrical wiring, and they've got to do at least a couple of thousand hours of training and pass all of these exams to become a a licensed HVAC technician. So don't ever try to do your own HVAC, like leave that to the professionals. But I didn't know that it was actually illegal. So that was interesting. All right, number six, did you know as little as half an amp, which is the equivalent, the equivalent of a nine volt battery can kill you? Did you know that? (laughs) That is so interesting. This is what I learned. Okay, so if there's if there's one area that uh, I usually tend to err on a lot, like air on the side of caution, it's electrical. I mean, even though I've done the wiring in my shed, um, it did. it is something to take seriously. You know, a lot of times if I'm doing something in the house, changing a light, I know there's some receptacles that I have to change in the kitchen. Um, I will shut off the entire power to the entire room. Like I'm not even, I think I've got maybe two circuits. No, I know for a fact I've got two or three circuits in my kitchen 
uh, electrical circuits. And instead of me trying to figure out which receptacles go to which circuit, I will just kill the entire kitchen. And <laughs> I'm not even trying to figure it out. Um, so yes, I take electrical very seriously. But when I learned that even even as little as half an amp can kill you, that's about the amount of amps in a nine volt battery. <laughs> My instructor said that voltage cooks you and amps kills you. And according to my research, the average house has between 100 and 200 amps running through it. So that's a lot of amperage. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take very much to kill you when it comes to electrical wiring. So please, if, if at any time you need to even just change a, you know, the, the outlets and you're not sure how to do it, don't second guess yourself. Don't be like, well, Serena, she wired her entire shed. So I can change a, a little outlet. Eh, eh, no, hire somebody. If you've never done it before, hire somebody. In fact, the ones in my kitchen, I'm thinking about just hiring somebody to come in and just do it. Not that I couldn't do it, but you know, sometimes it just, it just pays to have somebody professional come in and do that. Okay, this is really interesting. I started doing a little bit of research on this because when I was looking over this fact, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was like, what? You can actually re-roof over your existing roof twice. Okay, tell me if you thought like I did, right? If you're getting a new roof, I thought that the roofing company comes in and they have to remove the old shingles. I thought that's just what they did, right? Like if you walk through your neighborhood and you see these, you know, young guys, I'm going to say young guys, because old guys, it's a lot of work. It's backbreaking work, um, being a roofer. And you would see them stripping it down to the sheathing and putting new, new, uh, new tiles or asphalt tiles on the roof, shingles. But apparently you can actually re-roof over a roof twice, before it requires stripping. Now, of course, when I did a little bit of research on this, I saw some sites that was like, nah, you, you don't want to do that. You know, you have to make sure that your route, your, your roof is structurally sound because you're adding more weight to it. And there's probably other things that you want to consider before doing this. Some sites said, mm, you only really want to do it once max, but my carpentry teacher said it can be done. Technically it can be done twice. So if you are in the market for a new roof, at least ask the roofing company, hey, what do you think about re-roofing? Is that something that we can do? And then, you know, they could actually tell you, oh yeah, you know, your roof looks like it's pretty sound. And so I think we can do that and maybe that'll get you, you know, so ever, so many other year, more years out of this roof before you have to strip it and redo it. And so when I did some research, I found that it can actually be about 25% less by just uh, re-roofing with um, new shingles over the existing shingles. And these are the asphalt shingle, shingles. So, you know, if you have like a terracotta roof, like you're not going to put two layers on that. I'm talking about asphalt shingles, but I didn't know you could actually do that. So for those of you in the market for a roof, and I do know of one friend in particular, <laughs> and you know who you are if you're listening, uh, you definitely should at least ask. And if they say, no, nope, that we don't recommend that. Okay, maybe you get two quotes, but it helps to at least mention it so that they know, hey, I'm aware that I could possibly do this for less. All right, number eight, very interesting. So <laughs> water pipes, when they bring water into your house, it's pressurized, right? Well, it's not actually done magically. There's no pump on the street that's pumping water into your house. <laughs> this is what I learned. So I learned that when you turn on the water, right? Like thankfully we live in a country and I'm not even going to say country because there, believe me, there are certain parts of this, this nation where there are still people that don't have clean drinking water. But generally when you are um, living in a place where you can turn on the water, you get clean water and it comes into your house it's not magic. It's actually related to the different size pipes of CPVC, copper or PEX drinking water pipes that are bringing water into the house. So when water flows into the house, like to the water heater, to our sinks, our tubs, 
the changing from going wide to narrow sizing of the pipes, that's what creates the pressure pressurization. So that pressurization allows us to what, run the water forcefully from the faucets. So you're going from, let's say, a one inch pipe to a three quarter inch pipe to a half inch pipe. And all that squeezing and pushing through these pipes creates the water pressure that we need in our homes. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, if you're if you're a plumber or you're married to a plumber, you may have already known that. <laughs> but when I had learned that, I just thought it was fascinating because it's just one of those things we never think about, right? You turn on the faucet and the water comes, but you don't you don't really know the mechanisms for how that happens. Um, one thing that's interesting to know too is that like PVC and older cast iron pipes. So those remove waste and those are actually sloped away from our homes and that helps carry the waste to the main water uh, water waste lines. And those typically leave the house in smaller pipes, maybe like, eh, let's say two to four inches, and then they dump it into six to eight inch pipes. So those waste pipes, those aren't under any pressure like the drinking pipes are. And you know, that's why you have that sloping because it's gravity that's pulling that away from your house. So water coming in is pressurized from bigger to smaller pipes. And then leaving is going from small to large, and you're just using gravity. So isn't that pretty cool? Like, just think about, and I guess I should have researched this, but think about how people figured that out. (laughs) And when did they figure that out? And, you know, when did we get indoor plumbing? I should have figured, I should have done some research on this before so that I could have said, hey, did you know that we first got indoor plumbing? I should Google it real quick. But anyway, I'll give you an assignment. Google it. If you're interested in that, Google it. (laughs) All right. Interesting fact number nine, a carpenter does not have to be licensed. I know this, this, this surprises me. Because when you look at all the other requirements and licensings for other tradespeople, you would think that a carpenter would be required to be licensed, but they're not. They simply get something called, um, this is kind of known in the trades as OJT, on-the-job training. And there are four types of carpenters. You've got a rough carpenter. That's your carpenter that's going to build the framing of the home. And that's what you don't see once a home is built. That's all the two-by-fours and the the, you know, all the framing, the two by four. Well, if you're building a home, you're not using two by fours. If you're building a shed, you're doing two by fours, but uh, rough carpet carpentry for home is like two by six, two by eight. And you've got even bigger, um, you know, bigger wood that you're using for um, like the beams and things like that. Um, You've got a finished carpenter and that's the carpenter that's installing the decorative moldings. And you've got a carpet carpentry I can't say this, a cabinetry carpenter. (laughs) Try saying that 10 times quickly. And then you've got like a furniture making carpenter. So all the other trades, with the exception of the mason, they all have to be licensed, including the architect, you've got the surveyor, the excavator, the electrician, the plumber, the HVAC person. These usually, these trades usually require about 144 hours of classroom time And then about 2,000 hours of work experience. But the carpenter and the master carpenter, they don't have to be licensed. (laughs) Now, there are programs, of course, right? Like I went through a carpentry program for um, at the local college. But I could go right now on a job site and just get trained, become eventually become like a master carpenter. I don't have to do any schooling. There's no tests required. Um, you would think that that would require some classwork and and work out hours, but it doesn't. Now, I will say that that's for a carpenter, right? Like you could just hire a carpenter. Now, if you're like a licensed contractor, if you're um, hiring somebody to you know come in and and demolish your house or build um, you know like an addition on your home, you do have to get a licensed carpenter. But, you know, I'll tell you, I went through the license, the contract licensing classes, and it was, I don't remember how many hours it was. It was, it was not very many. I mean, it was like maybe a couple weekends and then you take a test and I'll tell you the test that they're taking, it's all like contract legal stuff. It has nothing to do with, okay, well, if you're building this house, 
how do you know, or what size wood do you use? Like they're not asking technical questions. This is all like legal type stuff. Um, I never did actually take the, uh, the, the test to become a licensed contractor. I should have, I really should have, but I don't know, I guess because I wasn't, I, I didn't see where I was going to be using that anytime soon. So I just never went, but I did do, I did do the, um, the course. So I could still do that if I wanted to. All right. Number 10, your new shed may have to be inspected before using it. And yes, that even includes tree houses. All right. So when we own a home, we think that we can do, sometimes we think that we can do anything we want to the property because we own the property, but that's not the case. You know, there's, there's so many changes that require permits and this includes building a shed. Um, when I built my she shed, my 16 by 26 shed, I had to get a permit for it. The paperwork that Tough Shed had submitted on my behalf, I don't know what in the world they were thinking because all they did was submit like, you know, just a, a 2D schematic of what the shed was going to look like. And they included a little bit of information about the actual construction of it. No, this, no, this, this county, they wanted a lot more information. They wanted drawings. They wanted to know, um, you know, what other things were they asking me? They, they were asking me things that Tough Shed didn't even in, anticipate. <laughs> so they had to go back to their architects and say, oh, you know, we need more extensive plans. And I'm thinking, don't you, like, where are you building these Tough Sheds that you've never been required to submit this information? I don't get it. Um, but yeah, if you're in your jurisdiction, if you are building a shed, that has to be for the most part. Now, it depends on where you live because some counties here in Maryland, if your shed is, I believe, below 200 square feet, they don't require you to have a, um, a permit. But here in Montgomery County in Maryland, oh, it's it doesn't matter. Like you could be doing an eight by eight shed where you're just keeping your lawnmower and some other tools. And they're like, yep, we, we need to see a permit. And even if it's uh, less requirements because mine was, was was larger, they still needed to see a permit. Even if you do a tree house or any other kind of structure on your property, they want to see a permit. So you have to just be careful and look, you know, check with your county and see what, what, what do they require you to submit when you want to do something on your property that they may consider to be a, sh a shed or an outbuilding, depending on what you're planning to use it for. Just make sure that you're checking so that you're not moving forward and then later finding, oh, you know what? We were supposed to get a permit for that. Even if you're doing a tree house for your kids, we were supposed to get a, a permit for that because they will come and they can re require you to, to remove it. I mean, could you imagine being three quarters of the way done your tree house for your kids or a small little shed for yourself, eight by eight shed. And you've got the county knocking on your door saying, Hey, here's a, a cease, a work cease order. <laughs> and you need to actually tear that down. I don't know if they would say tear it down, but they would tell you to stop and you can't move forward until you get all the paperwork in order. So just make sure that you're checking wherever you live. Number 11, your home could survive a hurricane if you have this type of foundation. Now, before enrolling in a carpentry program, I thought that for the most part, all homes, all buildings were just built with plain old concrete. I had no idea that there was something called ICF. It's, it's called insulating concrete forms. And my instructor had told the class that during the Hurricane Katrina, right, this devastating hurricane 2005, in this one particular area, everything had been destroyed except for one house that was still standing. And guess what that house had been built with? <laughs> yeah, it was built with insulating concrete forms. And what it is, it's this thick foam that once it's built, it's then filled with concrete. And it has this higher R value. And R value just means how resistant is it to heat flow. It has a higher R value than concrete alone. And it can withstand natural disasters better than concrete. So, you know, if you are if you are building a house or if you're planning to build a house, I mean, I think in this day and age with climate change and you just don't know, I mean, you might live in an area where you tend to get more hurricane activity, but 
at this point, I feel like if I were building a house, I would automatically make sure that that concrete or that foundation is ICF. And, you know, of course, whoever the contractor is, is building your home, talk to them about it. I mean, they would know, but just let them know that there is this option that you've heard about insulating concrete forms. And is that something that you could do for your home? And so you can actually go online. There's, there's videos that explain it a little bit more, but it's kind of amazing that, you know, with the day and age that we live in, if your home gets hit by a hurricane, you want to make sure that you've got some building materials that are going to withstand that, hopefully. All right, surprising thing number 12, cheap windows from Home Depot are actually Pella or Anderson windows. <laughs> now, back in, I want to say it was 2010, it might have been the same year we bought our house. We had windows replaced in our home and it cost $14,000. Now, that sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but for 22 windows, I remember my carpentry teacher, he's like, well, actually, that wasn't that wasn't too bad. I was like, are you kidding me? That was expensive, especially for new, like newly, uh, well, we had never earned, we had never owned a single family home before. So we were freaking out about having to spend this money, which we didn't, we didn't realize when we went to buy our house, we just didn't know that we were going to have to get, have to get new windows. And, uh, we didn't go with like low end windows. Instead, we had bought like the mid grade, but I learned in carpentry class that if you go to Lowe's, like those quote unquote low end windows that Home Depot sells, they're just the lower, they're the lower name brand windows, or I should say the lower grade windows for Pella or Anderson. So you're still buying name brand windows. So don't feel that, you know, you have to be talked into a uh, higher end window. Like, yeah, it might have more features, but don't think that just because you're buying the low end, more affordable windows that you're getting crappy windows. Like you're not, you're still getting name brand windows. You're just getting, you know, the, the lower end, but yeah, there's still Pella and Anderson windows and those for the most part, they have a good reputation. So that's good to know. All right. Interesting thing. Number 13, reading blueprints is like learning a new language. I can tell you, I actually really enjoyed my blueprint class. <laughs> it, it was like reading a new language, like learning a new language, because, you know, things that we, we call, for example, a light, right? Like I'll say, oh, you know, this room has two lights, but in blueprints, it's called a luminaire. <laughs> so there's different words for things that we commonly know, or like when you're talking about a glass window, you know, for example, those doors that have the, um, the different, like maybe you have like nine panels of glass. Well, we just say it has like glass in the windows. Um, but those are actually called lights, <laughs> right? So I remember sitting there being confused, like lights, there's nine lights. You're talking about the door. The door has lights. Like, what are you talking about? Um, but it was just interesting how, you know, this, this whole different, uh, area of, of like, I say DIY, but it's not DIY. I mean, it's home improvement, construction, they speak a different language. And it was just really interesting to, you know, hear them speak or hear the teacher speak and call it luminaires and lights. And then look at these drawings and have to be able to figure out, you know, what does this symbol mean? You know, and of course, they've got legends and you can, you can see what the legends are and what those symbols mean. But it was just really fun. I thought it was fun. I'm kind of a nerd anyway. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of like learning Spanish, right? There's different words for Spanish, like friend, um, bathroom. But when you're looking at a, a blueprint, you have to learn the language of this blueprint. And it's, just, I don't know, I got an A in the class. I loved it. And I wish that I could, you know, take some of these classes again, or maybe um, just, I don't know, like, just be able to study it a little bit more because I feel like we just scratched the surface, right? Anyway, I, I loved it. I loved it. So that was interesting. Um, fact number 14, you might know this if you're a homeowner, but if you're not a homeowner, this might be interesting for you to know. You don't actually own 100% of your property. Now, along the street, right along your curb, do you know that that 
there's about a four foot amount of space in front of your home near the street that you don't actually own. Guess who gets to dictate what you do with that little bit of space? The government. (laughs) That's right. It's officially called easement in construction speak. And it's the amount of space from the street, right? This setback that allows your county to do things like bury utilities. They can plant trees. They can do anything else that they need to get done, right? They can, um, you know, they don't even necessarily tell you when they come and and dig up this part of your yard. So uh, like, for example, Verizon, Verizon will just come, I think they came to my neighborhood not that long ago and, and started like digging up the front yard. And I'm like, there's nothing that they posted that said, hey, we're going to be starting construction here. <laughs> they just came and started digging. Um, but this is one thing that's, that's interesting. Like you're responsible for caring for that part, but you don't actually get to decide what to do with that. So if your company, if your let's say your, your uh, neighborhood has trees like mine, I have a lot of trees in my neighborhood and it's like, um, tree lined, all of those trees that are along that four foot area from the curb in during, uh, for that easement, it's actually owned by those trees are owned by the county. So I can't just decide that I want to cut down that tree. I've got to call the county. And if you've ever called the county in order for for them to come and take care of county owned trees, the last time I did that, it took a year for them to come and actually, did they remove? I don't know if they removed the tree, but they came and maybe just cleaned it up a little bit. But it took a year. Actually, no, it was, it was, they did remove the tree because I think the tree was dead. And so I put in a, a request and they had to come and cut it down, but it took a year. And then I think it took another year for them to come back and actually grind down the stump. <laughs> so yeah, that tree is not your tree. And unfortunately, you don't own 100% of your property. So that was interesting to learn. All right, number 15, attached garages, attached garages must have five eighths inch thick drywall. All right. So garages, for the most part, garages are more than just attached storage for all your thrift store furniture finds or whatever junk you store in there. Some people actually store their cars. I I'm, I'm being funny. I can, I could never store my car in there. I think I, I think I pulled my Honda Accord in there maybe like once or twice. And when I did it, I had to take a picture and post it on social media. Like, look what I just did. And it lasted for all of like five minutes because then I pulled it out. I was like, there's no way. Uh, It doesn't even seem like it's wide enough. Like, how do people even pull into their garage? Because I feel like my van, I have a Honda Odyssey. I feel like the van is so wide that there's only about a few inches on either side of the mirrors, the rearview mirrors, to even get it in there. Like, how? How do people even park in their garage? Anyway, that's a different aside. Um, But did you know that uh, garages have to have thicker drywall because what if, and this is by code, what if there was a fire in your garage, whether it's something with your car, whether it's, let's say a string trimmer, like a gas, uh, gas string trimmer, something, something happens and you have a fire in your garage, that five eighths, five eighths inch thick drywall is going to help prevent or keep that fire contained so that it doesn't spread to the rest of the house, right? Because you've got you've got gas and lawn tools and all kinds of things in there that are combustible. So you have to have thicker drywall. And that's something to keep in mind. So if if I mean this is good to know, so it is surprising, but here's here's where it really matters. Let's say that you needed to cut, I don't know, you're doing some sort of repair in your garage and you've got to cut the drywall. And or maybe let's say you have a hole in your drywall, in your garage. Well, it's going to be five eighths inch thick. So when you go to replace that drywall and um, you're going to probably have to get a full piece of drywall because remember drywall comes in different thicknesses. Most times in your house, you're going to get half an inch thick. Older homes, I think my entire home might be five eighths inch thick. I don't think they do that anymore. But um, if you notice that the drywall that you buy is thinner than the, the drywall that you have, it's because you bought the wrong thickness. So if it's a piece of drywall that you're replacing in your garage, make sure that you're measuring it because m- most likely it's going to be five eighths inch thick. 
Um, believe me, I've done this myself <laughs> where I was replacing some kind of drywall. I think it's when I was in the basement replacing some drywall there. And I didn't even think about the fact that I have five eight inch, five eighths inch thick drywall. I just bought whatever drywall I thought I needed and it wasn't the same thickness. And so I couldn't do the repair, had to go back to Home Depot and it just means more back and forth. So something to keep in mind, something to keep in mind. All right. Interesting fact number 16, it's expensive to hire an architect. Now, it never really occurred to me before enrolling in carpentry classes that I would even want to build a house from scratch, right? Like I always just thought, oh, you just buy an existing home. But after going through the whole experience of reading blueprints and doing a framing class, I I love the idea of building a house from scratch. Oh, and I did an architecture class too. And one of the assignments was we had to design a house and there were certain requirements. It had to have a certain number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and that was exciting because here I was creating this house and I'm like, I could actually build my own home. I mean, of course you have to have the land. Um, but when I found out that hiring an architect can actually cost upwards of like 5000 to $10,000, depending on the plot of land and the floor plan that they need to create for you, the blueprints, you know, you can, you can buy blueprints online and you may only need an architect to just tweak them to your county's code, but it's still expensive. And then you've got to hire the surveyor and the excavator and the carpenters and the masons. Oh, it sounds exhausting. <laughs> I mean, for any of you who have who has built a home from scratch and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like going through what is it, Ryan Builders, and they already have their whole team. I'm talking about you bought a plot of land. And now you are hiring a um, architect to create these plans and you've got to do all these things yourself from scratch. Who that sounds like a lot of work, um, but it sounds exciting too, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyway, I just thought that was interesting. I, I had no idea that it cost that much money to hire an architect. All right, number 17, homeowners are responsible for broken pipes on their property, not the water company. This is probably the best tip that you could ever hear from me because it can save you thousands of dollars in repairs. So you are responsible, you homeowner, talking to you, you're responsible for any broken or clogged pipes on your property. So that includes, remember, we talked about, um, you know, the pressurization, right, of the water coming into your house. And then there's the waste pipes that's going, taking waste away from your home. Those are two different systems. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's 20 feet from your front door or if it's two feet from your front door. If it's on your property, then you're responsible for it. And I can tell you right now that your regular homeowner's insurance doesn't cover any of these repairs, you know, and it's not as simple as just gluing them back together. <laughs> so there was a friend of mine, um, I called him Thrift Store Pete. He had shared with me that on his property, one of his older cast iron waste pipes had started to break. It was becoming like uncoupled and it was just enough to allow the water to seep out. So it wasn't like this dire emergency, but it wasn't something that he wanted to leave broken. And, you know, when that happens, when they start to uncouple, tree roots can extend into your pipes, right? They're seeking water and then they're going to create even more issues. Well, for Pete to fix this, it was going to cost him, or it, it did cost him, no, at the time when I talked to him, he had a quote for $10,000, $10,000 to fix some cast iron pipes underneath your ground on your property. And I remember him like, uh, you know, I don't want to pay this money. And I thought, I, I think he was saying that the plumber could do something temporary. I don't remember what that was, but what happens is that the plumbing company can rip up your flooring, right? It could be in your basement or they can rip out your yard. And that $10,000 fee is only to fix the pipe. That's not paying for any kind of cleanup and repair to the damage to your floor, to your yard. You know, then you can tack on a few more thousand dollars to fix that flooring. And you're into the, phew, like you could have bought a new car price of repairs. So here's the solution. And I, I don't think that I'm even fully covered. But the solution to this problem is you have to get extra insurance, right? You have to check with 
you can check with your water company for a recommendation, but the company that I use is called HomeServe. And they actually had like reach out to me, right? I think it's just, I don't know. Maybe they just send it to everybody and just says, hey, did you know that you're responsible if something happens? So I had gotten, I think that I had gotten coverage to cover the waste pipes. And I didn't realize, oh, wait a minute. You're telling me that I need a separate policy to cover the water coming into my property? Because remember, those are two different systems. So I I say in the last three months, maybe could have been four months, I just got insurance to cover those incoming water pipes. <laughs> so, and it's not expensive. I mean, I think I paid, was it like $67 for the year? I mean, the amount of money that I pay per year for this is insanely cheap compared to what it would be. And, and, you know, I'd probably have to sit down and look at, you know, everything that it covers, but believe me, that $67 is nothing compared to what it's going to cost if something happens. So, you know, if you are a homeowner, please look into, uh, interior plumbing coverage. And I think it's called drainage system coverage. Those are two different security policies and they will cover, up to a certain, maybe it, it might cover up to $10,000. So just look into it. That's that's probably the most important thing that you will hear on this podcast today. <laughs> I could save you thousands of dollars. All right, uh, we're almost to the end here. Interesting fact number 18, the concrete in the Hoover Dam is still curing. That's right. So this I actually had learned when my carpentry instructor was talking to us about how long it takes for concrete to to dry, right? So it takes 28 days, almost an entire month for four inches of concrete to fully cure. And so with all the amount of concrete slabs that were used to build the Hoover Dam in 1935, the inside of these concrete sections will take years to fully cure. (laughs) So it's very hard on the outside, but on the inside, it's still wet and it's curing as we speak. Isn't that interesting? Okay, very interesting. All right, number 19, low hums can damage your hearing just as much as high-pitched noises. Now, I will tell you that over my years of doing DIY, I haven't always been 100% when it comes to being safe when working on projects. I mean, there's times when I, I, this is early on, I would say. There've been times when I would skip safety glasses. I've used power tools when I'm wearing flip-flops. I don't do that anymore, but that was a huge thing. You should only wear like boots or sneakers. I would say not even sneakers. Like I like wearing the composite toe uh, boots when I'm doing projects, especially if you could drop something like a blade, if you could drop a two by four, protect your toes. And I have, I'll admit I've skipped wearing hearing protections or protection at times when I'm making quick cuts. Used to, I don't do that anymore. For the most part, like now, I mean, I'm always listening to podcasts. I'm listening to um, music or something like that when I'm, when I'm working like in my shed or, or whatever. But what's interesting is, and they're noise canceling headphones, but what's interesting and with what's surprising is that it's not just loud noises from power tools that could damage your hearing. I learned in class that low frequency noises can also damage your hearing. Did you know that? Like I had no idea. So like low hums can still damage your hearing. I had to Google that because I was like, he can't be right. Like he didn't just say that, did he? But it's true. So, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, even if your your tools or, or things around your house that you may think, well, that's not a high pitched noise that, 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 that can't do any damage. Just make sure that you're protecting your ears when you need to, even if it's a low hum. So that's interesting. All right, and the last one, number 20, all safety glasses must have this label. All right, so I thought that like all safety glasses were the same, but they're actually not. They they have to have something called, well, not something, but if you look on your safety glasses, they have to have something called, uh, with labeled Z87. So, you know, go, go grab your safety glasses, go look at them and you'll either see it on the side or you'll, you'll see it on the 
the glass. So this Z87 will be listed somewhere in small print. And what this means, I mean, I don't know exactly what the Z87 means um, in terms of like, I don't know, was it like created in 1987 by someone named Zoe? I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is that that label tells you, tells me, the consumer, that if if your eyes need to be protected, um, these are going to protect them. They're shatterproof. And so I think the way that my carpentry teacher explained it is, you know, if you had a nail coming at you from across the room, um, let's say from a nailer, <laughs> it just shot across the room, these glasses can actually protect your eyes. So that's, that's pretty important to know. Um, and I, I mean, at this point, I would think most, I mean, if you're going to Home Depot or Lowe's, all of those glasses, for the most part, would have Z87. But I would say, you know, don't go to the dollar store and buy glasses there. I just feel like they're just probably cheaper. Just stick to the home improvement stores to get your glasses and you should be fine. All right. So that's what I have for you today. Those are 20 interesting things that I learned in carpentry class. I miss carpentry class. I really, really do. And I think when you're someone like me who enjoys learning, um, you're always looking for opportunities to um, improve and learn new things. So hopefully, if you're like me and you like to learn new things, hopefully you learn new things during this one hour session with me just talking about interesting things that I learned. Um, be sure to come back next week. I don't know what we're going to be talking about, but whatever it is, we're going to have a great time. And I want you to leave me a review. That's something that I don't ask for hardly at all. And some people have said, I don't even know how to leave a review, but wherever you're listening to this, whether it's on Google, Apple podcasts, wherever, see if you can actually leave me a review. Let me know what you think of the thrift diving podcast. If you can't figure out how to leave a review, then email me because I actually save all of the emails that I get from people telling me that they enjoy my podcast episodes that they really resonated, uh, that, that resonated with them. And it makes me feel good showing up every week knowing that you're listening. And even though there's not very many of you listening, and I'm okay with that <laughs> because I feel like I'm having a conversation with a friend, just me and you talking on a Sunday evening. <laughs> so yeah, let me know what you think. Serena at thriftdiving.com. You can email me. All right, be sure to come back and I will see you next episode. Find it ugly, make it pretty mm. Paint the power tools, alright Saving money with those thrift store vibes